Hey class, it's Professor McHugh here, Business of Film Music, Fall 2017. I'm lucky enough to be sitting here with Emmy-nominated Guild of Music Supervisor President, President Thomas Golubich. How are hey you, Hey, everybody. Friend? Good, good. Good. Thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. Big week for him. Just uh, nominated for an Emmy. Um, so good one for you. Thanks for coming on board and My pleasure. talking to the students. Thanks, everybody. I hope you have an interesting uh, time ahead. Oh, we will. So, Thomas, why don't we just start at the beginning? Like, how did you get in this business, what was your background and what was your history that that brought you to this business and you know started you out? I think it kind of goes back to being uh, 10 years old and my dad taking me to the 10th year anniversary of 2001 A Space Odyssey, the Stanley Kubrick film. And my dad uh, basically brought me to uh, Boston University, he's a professor there, uh, a screening and I was mesmerized by the movie. And I think in that moment, I kind of realized that I was really uh, susceptible to the power of music and film. And it was just one of those things that really stuck with me. So I didn't realize growing up in Boston and having a dad who was an academic that there was really any option of you know, doing music for a living or film for that matter. I assumed other people do that. And so I never really thought that that was something that we could make happen. Um, Years later, uh, I went to film school. Uh, my plan was to be a writer-director, and I uh, studied very um, aggressively and uh, ended up writing a lot of scripts. I wrote most of the scripts of my graduating class because uh, most of them would write these terrible scripts about like being on a bad date, and I was basically ripping off like Harold Pinter plays, so it seemed better, but it was you know like all good things. I was just stealing other people's ideas and reformulating them. Hopefully you guys are all very good at doing that as well. Um, and uh, so I ended up uh, becoming a, a journalist. I got distracted in the middle of film school. Uh, the, the war in Yugoslavia was happening. My dad was from part of that country. Uh, I went out there as a journalist and I worked there for a year and a half uh, as a journalist. And that led to me working for the UN for a while in New York. Wait, what year is this? What year are we talking uh, about? This is 91 through 92. Wow. How, so talk about that because I've never talked to you about this. Part of, by the way, part of the fun, like I know Thomas for years, like about digging deep into people's lives and get to sit down and find out the stuff. So talk about what that was experience was like being in Yugoslavia in a war-torn country. Uh, you know, it's weird. Um, I was, you know, I was a 20-year-old. Um, I was very cognizant of the fact that uh, we don't have a, a draft here in this country. Um, I had several friends who were Israelis who were, were, had you know, been part of the draft there. And I kind of recognized that their concept of sacrifice was a rather unusual one. Um, I was a little bit disenchanted with film school. I went to Boston University, which honestly was a mediocre film school at the time. I don't know how it is now, but it wasn't great back then. Um, and uh, I was really intrigued with politics. And I started writing papers about what was happening because the war hadn't started yet. So I wrote two papers that were analyzing what happens when socialist um, economies begin to collapse. And Yugoslavia was a bit of a pyramid scheme. Tito was a very smart leader. Tito. And in short, Legendary. Yep, he found a great way of using the East and the West against each other and pulling money from both. So when he died, nobody was really able to continue that kind of charismatic leadership. So you had a power vacuum. And what ended up happening was, uh, because socialism was beginning to die, 89 happened, you know, the, the wall fell in Germany, uh, you know, the Soviet Union dismantled. And what ended up happening was basically uh, people realized socialism had no future and that nationalism did. So uh, that led to a couple of papers I wrote. Then I had an opportunity to um, basically uh, uh, talk to a guy who was there and he was kind of interested in seeing what happens. There was concern that the war might begin. And so I went that summer supposedly to go to a house on an island uh, in, in the uh, Dalmatian coast. And then the war happened while I was there. So my brother went home and I stayed. And I worked for the Foreign Press Bureau. Uh, I worked as a guide to go to the front lines. Um, and then uh, basically worked for uh, Reuters, for AP, uh, for Deutsche Allgemeine Zeitung, uh, for a Dutch paper. Basically anybody who was there and would go out and would sort of work as, you know, not quite a translator because my creation wasn't that good. But I was good at finding places and getting to where the stories were. And as more shit went down, uh, I would just get to know people who knew where to be at the right place at the right time. So wow. uh, I did that for about a year. And then I came back 
uh, worked at the UN for a little bit, uh, but was very disenchanted with how uh, the UN was handling it. And the war in Bosnia was beginning to brew. And I realized that they were not going to be able to help that situation, that nobody was really taking it seriously. And everybody was sort of messing it up, basically. So I left the whole thing and finished up my film degree and moved to the West Coast. Uh, ended up in Los Angeles, started an internet magazine. Uh, I went belly up, the LA Magnet, Los Angeles Magazine on the Net. 1995 was the year, way oh, too Magnet early. Magnet together, yep. I like that. There you go. I like it. And it was a mess. I lost uh, $12,000 <laughs> in six months trying to keep it together, which wow. at the time was a lot of money Was it me. focused on music? Or? No, it was actually, uh, my thinking was that the, we used to have the LA Weekly, sure. we had the LA Village View, and we had the LA Reader. Right. And the LA oh, Village View and the LA Reader got bought by the New Times who came in from Phoenix. Right. And they fired everybody. And I noticed that everybody in the masthead of those two publications lost their job, except for the advertising people who brought in the money and the film critic. So I called and hired everybody else and basically said, I want to do an internet magazine. I was working at Fox at the time and I realized that they were all about to have internet in all their computers. And there were only two people that had it then. Uh, Bill Mechanic had it, uh, Jim Giannopoulos had it, and the tech people. And I convinced them to hire me and let me get access to it. And then I built the magazine working for them for a year. And as everybody got set up, I met with all the people, the heads of all the different studios. So the homepage would be the LA Magnet. Nice one. So the idea was to then set that up and then be part of the economics of it. So if someone were to buy tickets for a concert or whatever, you could do it through this. Participate, right. Exactly, participate. But it was too early. There was no internet magazine at the time. The LA Weekly didn't have a publication, didn't have an online presence. Wow, so you were before anybody. So you had the right idea, but it just... Ruined. Right idea, wrong timing. Right. Story of my life. So yeah, and I lost a lot of money and I'm terrible at business. So it was a mix of a whole bunch of things. Right. Good ideas, bad execution. Sure. Uh, that led to me, uh, my girlfriend and I broke up, uh, she took the cats, I ended up uh, volunteering at a radio station called KCRW, and basically they were going to have an internet presence for the first time, so I thought, I fucked this up really terribly, why don't I help them not do the same, pardon my language. And so long story short, I volunteered for them, and uh, helped them put together a proposal to get a, a redesign or a design for their website. And then uh, they said, hey, if you, you like music a lot, you want to volunteer, we have a volunteer spot in the library. So I volunteered in the library. I became friends with Gary Calamar, who we both know. Uh, we became buds and basically just flirted with girls and listened to music and made jokes, tried to make each other laugh. And uh, I realized I was not enjoying the writing and graphic design that I was doing. Uh, the magazine was dead in the water. And someone said, why don't you look into A&R? So I got offered an A&R job for a Warner subsidiary label and realized I would fail terribly at it, so I decided not to do it. Because? Um, because the stuff that I was interested in, I was championing a band called Cinematic Orchestra, and they had approached me because they wanted to sign bands that were quote unquote similar. I also knew that they would never make any money from it, and I talked to Chris Doritas and uh, to Jason Bentley, both who were working one at Maverick, one at DreamWorks, and they both said that the way the music industry works, they all want to be cool, but they want to make money, which means that they need you to find things that will make money for them. Everything I was interested in was making no money for anybody. So More I think, taste. Yeah, and so I think that I realized that I would fail at right. this. So someone said, well, if you don't want to work in A&R, why not music supervision? And I said, well, what is that? And they said, well, you went to film school. Didn't you learn about that? Nobody ever mentioned music supervision when I went to film school in the 90s. And uh, they said, well, there's this guy who does it. Uh, Gary Calamar is, is talked to him about maybe working with him on something. Why don't you see if he needs an intern? And that was G. Mark Roswell. So I met with G. Mark, and his library was a disaster, and I'm half German, so I'm very anally retentive. So I organized his entire library, which was tremendously fun. I was doing a radio show at KCRW at the time. Right, and I should tell you, KCRW, just for those who haven't listened, and you should listen, you should write these call letters down. Um, it's, a, it's a public radio station. It's one of the best in the country, and it's viewed as probably the tastemaker, one of the top two or three tastemaker stations in the whole country. And they have a program called Morning Becomes Eclectic, hosted by the gentleman he mentioned, Jason Bentley, who's the program director, who, to me, you know, the show has always been a great bellwether. And there's other shows, obviously, that are great and great jocks on the station. But it's non-commercial. They play what they want to play. It's just an amazing thing. And it's been a great platform for music supervisors. Absolutely. Both Chris, Chris Doritas, who used to have Jason's job, Thomas, Gary Calamar, Liza Richardson. Richardson. Um, Garth, I guess, has yep, done some stuff. Um, who, who else? else? Uh, what's our other guy's name? Uh, um, who am I forgetting? I know. 
it's almost like everybody's had a little. Well, shot again, at what it. it is is a platform, right? Yeah. So, yeah, that's um, I forget his name, um, but anyway, the point is that it's a platform, right? You need platforms in this world. So Thomas got, you're starting to talk about it, but you'll you'll see that it's you know he was able to parlay that platform. So, carry on. I would say tied to John's note right there, one of the great gifts of being a KCRW was that you listen to more music when you're doing radio shows than anything Any, imaginable. You have to. You have to. You have to know. You can't put shit on the air that it sucks, right? So you have to basically preview everything you, you're going into. So you have to do your research in advance before you do your show and put your show together. So you're forced to listen to music. So in a way, it's a perfect launch it's a great training ground also because we're all very competitive we're all hearing the same stuff really early and we're getting stuff this is at a time when digital wasn't really around you were getting cds in so we would all be in that library what's that lps probably too yeah absolutely and we get this stuff really early so we would all be kind of competing against each other to hear stuff first and be the first one to catch something that was really special and we used to for instance have like on cds i had a little silver pen i would put little crosses next to tracks that i liked and I knew Garth would always have like a black dot, and I knew Jason had a blue dot. So we'd almost know what each of us would respond to. And what ended up happening was it became a way of us all being aware of what each other are listening to, but also finding new things and kind of marking our terrain. So I think the benefit also, my family was not in LA, so my family was in Boston and I was broke. So I didn't have the option of going back home for the holidays, so I ended up sitting in for you everybody. Did shifts. You did, you did everybody gravy, would leave. You started town. on the graveyard shift. Absolutely, at two a.m. to five a.m. Saturday, how, Sunday. How it, that's how it got going. I did the gospel show from five a.m. to six a.m. <laughs> I did the reggae show. I did the hip hop show. I did the international show. I did the classical show. I did the jazz show. I sat in for everybody. And when you're doing that, you really learn not only to listen to the people who are doing the show ahead of you to get a sense of their audience and their taste but how to find your own angle to it. And that's what's exciting. So you start to get tangential about music and connecting things. And at the same time, I, I've watched more movies than most people, and I, I watch movies constantly. So I was really studying the craft of it. Uh, this is kind of before TV was taking off. This is sort of the mid-90s into the late 90s. And as television got better, I began to watch more of that. But most of my training was in film and watching lots of films and seeing how filmmakers would use music as a storytelling device. Like, what would Kubrick do? How did Hal Ashby do it? You know, what happens when you have like a, a Simon and Garfunkel song list running through an entire film? What does that feel like? Um, how does it work when you have films that are, you know, wall-to-wall music versus very spare? What does score do as an experience versus source? Um, how does a, a film work with the pacing of it when you start dealing with different acts and having a certain energy in the front end versus another end? You know, a lot of movies like TV operates where people have a lot of energy in the front end and then they get a little tired at the back end and that happens in production as well so sometimes a music supervisor is a person that can help to change the way the energy works and to right. calibrate that so if a film is flagging or the performances are flagging or even like the production is flagging sure. you can add an injection of energy to help it carry through yeah we had a, we just talked about we you know last week we had the composer and music producer of a movie i did the debut on netflix on friday called hashtag reality high where the movie's a teen comedy, if you will, and the director is super musical, and there were 35 songs in the movie. Wow. So it's basically, it keeps the pace moving of the movie, and as someone commented, you know, when, when the movie starts to lag, the music picks it back up. And that's what we do, in a way, if you mm-hmm. think about it. We have to, you know, add to the story, help tell it, but also make it, when it's flagging, pick it up. Yeah, or do the opposite, where you're actually choosing to slow a pace down, to change the expectations. Sometimes, you know, we'll work on a, on a film and we'll simply mark where we are in the storylines and figure out when do we notice that music's not there, when do we pull back to give the effect so there's more impact later. Right. It's very elastic, so you can do a lot to change sure. those things. So any questions so far in the early Thomas years? Because we're, we're about to get into it, but if anybody has any early questions... Okay. Wow, we've, we've stunned you all. All right, so they got questions for you later. But anyway, so, okay, so then talk about it. So talk about... Uh, yeah, no, this kid's fascinating. So anyway, so, um, so you and Gary, Gary get together at KCRW. Yeah, talk so, about that. So, yeah, so Gary and I are both working in the library, um, and I'm freelance writing and graphic design, terrible stuff mostly. 
And uh, Gary gets a gig with G Mark where he co supervises a movie called Slums of Beverly Hills. I it's started a high working. profile movie. Yeah. Nick exactly. Nolte, maybe that movie? Uh, is it Nick Nolte? God, I okay. don't even remember now. Okay. But it's a cute little movie, Al yeah. Alan Arkin. Alan Arkin, right. And uh, so I end up working with them. I start working as a, uh, uh, an assi uh, assistant, basically, as a coordinator on Varsity Blues, which is a, a, mm -hmm. a sort of football movie. And uh, Gary and I are kind of working on it together, which is great. Then I decide that I've been there for a year and I, I haven't gotten paid and I need so to move interned. on. So you interned? I interned, yep, for a year. And I started drifting towards a year and a half. And Gary was co-supervising. And we had talked a little bit about being partners, but I didn't want to be an unequal partner with him. So I felt like I needed to go out on my own. So I basically went out and did a documentary, which I made $3,000. It took two and a half years to finish. <laughs> it was a total, it was, it was a great film and it was an exhausting experience, but it was a great way of learning. It was basically about a burlesque show. So just imagine all of these women who are of extremely eclectic tastes, finding like porn films from the 70s from Italy, or finding like, you know, 50s era glamour icons and that one weird song that they wrote. I had to clear all this stuff. And it was unbelievably difficult. That led to another movie called Shadow Hours, which was basically an underground story with Peter Weller and Balthazar Getty, where the f director got fired halfway through and the producers brought in two new editors and told me to redo the entire movie from scratch with music and a new score. Brian Tyler I brought on board as a composer and we rebuilt the entire movie while the director would call me every night, an Israeli guy going like, are they kidding my movie? They're kidding my movie. What are they doing to my movie? <laughs> so I learned a very valuable lesson, which is don't take sides. Right. Like find a way to please everybody, but find a way to please the film first and foremost. And we found a way to tempt the movie with completely new music, give it a lot more energy, a much more of a modern feel, got away from his sort of weird Tom Waits abstract lyrically oriented thing. Uh, Brian Tyler used a lot of those music beds to build a new sound for his own score, so he was developing cool stuff. And uh, the movie got into Sundance, and then suddenly everyone became friends again. So suddenly the director and the producer were all buds, and everyone got to take credit for it, and we got a standing ovation for the music at the thing, which was really nice. Right. My mom was there, so she got a chance to she see, like, to for the first about. time, she thought, oh my so god, my first, son's on a failure. one of your first movies got to Sundance? Yeah. It's amazing. So the note there for me is, the don't take sides note means it shows how political this job is. And I'll give you my one example of that. I was working at New Line Cinema. We had a movie called Blade, and it, you know, nobody knew what it was gonna be. It was based on a, a comic book. Uh, Wesley Snipes was the star, who was at his uh, height, and he was also the producer. The director was a guy named Stephen Norrington, who was British, one of the first ecstasy guys I ever met in my life. And he wanted all techno, which was called techno then, it was EDM now, in the movie. And Wesley wanted to infuse hip hop into the movie and the action fighting scenes, because there were amazing fighting scenes. So Wesley would invite me over to his um, condo on the beach, and he'd play all this music for me, and we'd get all hyped up. And then he'd say, yeah, yeah, go play for Norrington, right? Because he, politically, he was smarter than me. And so I'd go in with Norrington, and I'd say, hey, Steve, uh, what do you think of this? What do you think? He's Fuck that hip hop. Right. I don't want any hip hop. It's not, it's not this movie. We're not doing that. And then I did that once, and then Wesley got me in again, and I did it again, and Norrington threw me out of the editing room. Wow. It was the only time in my life I've ever been thrown out of an editing room. And, but I learned that powerful lesson. He goes, You're just Wesley's spy. You know, he gave me that rap. <laughs> and he was a crazy eclectic guy who never really made any movies again because he was a little nutty, but he made a good film. Mm -hmm. um, but I learned that. Yeah, that yeah, I learned that what he was talking about. You don't choose sides. You have to be Switzerland, right? Because yep. you're dealing with all these disparate people and they all have their own agendas. Yep. And you have to be true to the music and the director at the end of the day, whoever is running the show, yep. but there's all these different people pushing you on different agendas. So that's what we talked about, being very political and it's a nuanced business that you're never going to see your head get whacked off it's just going to happen if you've done some of the wrong things. Absolutely. And also tied to that, which is important, is that music is frequently the last thing that people are dealing with. Correct. Which means that if Wesley is trying to angle for power on something and Steven is angling for power on something and they're no longer an allied team, music is an area where they can do battle. And the idea being that we can be frequently in the middle of that. Right. So it's important for us to be able to recognize the politics, try not to play into it too right. much 
and try to always be, as you put it, Switzerland. And, and at the end of the day on that movie, I said, all right, I'm, I'm out, but I'm still going to do the soundtrack. And I had the rights to do the soundtrack. So what I did is I took Norrington's tracks, I took some of Wesley's tracks, I had remixers blend them together, mm -hmm. and the soundtrack went gold like almost immediately. There you go. Um, but, you know, and it's funny because I remember someone saying to me, why are you going to mess with this thing? Why would you put the soundtrack out? Why, you know, don't mess with these people. And I was like, no, no, I, I, I think... I think Wesley was actually right. Mm -hmm. And just because it was a time, it was EDM was coming up, hip hop was strong, and you put the peanut butter and the jelly together, yep. boom, and it worked. Yep. So anyway, sorry to interrupt. But uh, okay, so you do, you get with Gary, and mm -hmm. then what happens? So Gary ends up having a really easy movie. Like he literally sends a mixtape off to the filmmakers. They choose four or five songs from it. They place it in there. He goes to Sundance. So I was like in my version of Hell on Earth, and he was on like the version of Heaven. But we both got to Sundance, both films got picked up, and at that point I felt like, okay, maybe we can work together. Right. So we started Super Music Vision together, and we just tried to figure out what would be an interesting project. Now, as it turns out, we didn't have a whole lot of traction. Now suddenly we realize you don't get hired again so easily. So even though we both had movies that had a little bit of success, we didn't really have much traction. Uh, and then luckily, one of the assistant editors who worked on Shadow Hours basically got a gig working on an HBO pilot. And uh, she basically was very impressed with how I handled the mess of that film because she was fully aware, two editors getting fired and she stayed on for both, and how much the thing changed. So she recommended that I get, t uh, I, I find out about this pilot. She leaked the script to me. I read the script, I thought it was fantastic. And I reached out to the post-production producer who was a little bit pissed that I had you know, gotten the script but basically uh, tried to figure out whether I was you know, somebody who she wanted to have meeting. They were meeting with much bigger supervisors, including Maureen Crow, by the way, and all well-known people. And um, I ended up getting, convincing her to have a meeting just by being very kind of persistent. And basically they said, come on in, meet, and then why don't you bring in a mixtape of ideas? We have a problem, we're over budget for the pilot, we need some help. So I put together a mix and I called in a whole bunch of favors. Um, I found out that uh, Peggy Lee had just hired uh, an attorney to help represent some of her songs, and they were looking for opportunities. Ron Breitman, I think, was in, no, Seth Berg was involved in that, and Seth said, hey, I can maybe find a way to make this inexpensive. I think he still is, by the way. Is I think he really? He might. Unbelievable. So what ended up happening was they had an Ella Fitzgerald track, they couldn't afford it, and I basically rallied to try to have a Peggy Lee song called I Love Being Here With You as a song to help uh, out with the scene. The show ended up being six feet under and the pilot had a sequence where Nate, the eldest son, was having a memory of his dad, seeing his dad you know, cutting up a body and being freaked out by it. And that song played as nice counterpoint. It was less expensive than the Ella Fitzgerald and they liked the rest of the mix so they hired me and then I basically realized I couldn't do the job effectively on my own. I'd never done television before. So I contacted Gary and I said, why don't we do this together? And it was a great choice. And the show ran for how many years? Five years, five seasons. And what did you, how many uh, pieces of music normally per show did you guys do? Oh God, it was a lot Average. depending on, I would say somewhere between five and 12. Per show? Yeah. Wow, that's a lot, a lot of music. A lot of music. It's funny because I don't remember that much music from it. Uh, we try to be very invisible. Right. It was, but, uh, but anyway, for me, I watched every episode of that show. I was in, it's written by a guy named Alan Ball who's a fantastic writer. Um, you just did American Beauty right before that? Right, he just come off American Beauty, which won the Oscar for, mm -hmm. right, best film? Yep. And just a great pedigree, HBO was at its prime then. Yep. Um, it was one of the prime HBO Sopranos, shows. Sopranos, The Wire. Uh, there, right? Yeah, it was a fantastic window. So, but the, you know, what stuck it for me was the last season finale, right? Because here, here's a show, when you guys know, when you watch a show, you're invested in characters. Um, the end of the series is emotional as it, you know, as it can be because you're wondering what's going to happen with these characters. And so talk about finding the song for the end of that series. Yeah, um, so basically we, we were familiar with Sia and the song ended up being Sia's Breathe Me. We have a problem? No, no, I'm actually still working. <laughs> okay. You can leave the room. Sorry, yeah, we're, 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 we're all right, so that's long. hysterical. In today's well, world of streaming. I know, exactly. Uh, so long story short, we had, um, in the first season, we placed a song by a band called Zero Seven, and a song called Distractions, which fit really beautifully in the sequence, and there was a vocalist on it called Sia, and we loved her voice. We found it very... You guys heard of Sia? Yes. Okay. 
Just checking. Yeah. Uh, but at the time, she wasn't really that well known. She no, was just she literally was not. just a vocalist on a, a track. And so we reached out to her management in Australia and basically said, could you send us you know, the, a record? Is there anything more that we have? And they sent an album and it wasn't very good. It was okay. Her voice was distinctive, but the songs were kind of uh, underwhelming. Um, but we said, listen, if anything else comes along, we'd love to hear it. And uh, about a year later, they ended up sending uh, an album called Color the Small One, which was her second record. And we loved it. We thought it was really special. And we ended up um, pitching the uh, several songs actually for the fourth season, not the final one. And one of them actually did land in a sequence. And then when it came time for doing, uh, we used to do these trailers for each season, which was kind of great. They would bring the director and they would do an entire video shoot for the new season. And so we pitched uh, See Is Breathe Me for that trailer. That trailer ended up using that song, which was wonderful. And then Alan just loved it so much that he said, I'm gonna plan on doing the closing of the series through this song. So he so we knew, knew how far into the season, um, how far into the series that he was gonna use that? I don't think he knew, I think he knew that we were gonna use it for the trailer for the opening of the season, but I don't think he season, knew, yeah, season. but I don't think he knew that we were gonna use it at the end either. Okay. Um, and a lot of people don't remember that part. Like people all remember the, the final season, they don't remember the trailers no. that ran. So, uh, and we had just used Nina Simone's Feeling Good as a previous trailer. So it was kind of that an I interesting remember. lineup. And, uh, and long story short, when he came to us about, I don't know, 10 episodes in, uh, we basically realized, okay, this is what we're gonna build this closing out of. And I guess I shouldn't tell you too much of the detail of the closing, but long story short, we had several hurdles. Number one, we had a song that was four minutes and 20 seconds, and we had a sequence that was six minutes and 40 seconds, which meant we needed to get an instrumental. And by the way, this is all montage. All montage. No dialogue at all. The entire thing is basically a history of each character and their demise. And so uh, we were doing a lot of stuff that we're not good at. We're not good at makeup effects. We're not good at futuristic art direction or design. So the first cuts that we saw of this we're not good. And we were really worried that we were going to jump the shark in this moment. Like we're shooting in the future and we're having, you know, right. our actors. Watching people get old in front exactly. of your eyes. Yeah, I remember and it was like, there was no budget. It was really like, it did not look good. And we were very concerned. And the additional problem we had was that we had, she had never mastered her instrumental. So we had a mastered vocal and a non-mastered instrumental. So we had our music editor cutting between the two, changing the EQ so they would sort of match as much as possible and trying to find a way to make it work over the sequence. So we were convinced that it was gonna be a disaster. And only when we finally got to the end and we mixed it in the episode and we were all kind of crying did we realize that we'd gotten to the end of it. But we really thought that we were gonna screw this whole thing up. So how did you solve the problem about being two minutes short? How did you figure out where to loop into the song and what was that process like? We tried a number of different things. We tried first to chop up the early part to have a longer intro, but that didn't help. So we ended up using the intro as it was, and there was a break that was about three minutes and 40 seconds in, and there was a buildup. So we took a section of the buildup and we chopped them up in half measures. So we had half measures with slight changes, which were just enough that you didn't notice it and it felt emotionally right. Mm -hmm. uh, so there were probably, I'd say at least 20 cuts in there, Wow, a lot. And so the music kind editor of was a big part of yeah, making that Bruno work. Roussel. Because we were talking about job the job of the music editor mm -hmm. uh, before you walked in and, and you know what Sebastian did on this movie that I just did and how important it is to have that right music editor knowing where to be creatively fulfilled and you know putting his stamp on it and making it work right music editors are huge I mean a, a good music editor number one can temp a film and can get the tone right um, we tend to temp things a lot ourselves uh, but that said, we're working very closely with them. And on some projects, the music editor is actually better than we are at it because they're listening to more contemporary score or they go deeper or they find nuances. Every time I think that we're really good at temping stuff with score, we meet a music editor who's even better at it. Right. So it's a special kind of magic. So that's a huge part of it. And again, temping, obviously, you know, the film gets done. The composer has not started working yet on the movie. So to get the movie vis viewable for people, it has to have score in it, right? Because otherwise you watch a movie with no score and no songs, it's flat as a pancake. And so that temping of the right score and the right emotional moments or the, the horror with the sting, you know, the horror stings or whatever it is, is super important to the process of getting that movie down the road. And you know, literally you'll, you'll, you might show that movie at a research screening 
which could literally get you more funding to finish your movie or to get better music mm -hmm. or to get better placement. Or hire the right composer. Hire the right composer, whatever it is, that those early research screenings are normally done with temp music. So the supervisor and the music editor got to put their heads together and figure out, okay, what's the best temp score that we could put in this movie to make it feel good? Yeah, exactly know? right.